I'm not going to go through everything in here, but just giving you resources so you can keep learning and praying with these things. Uh, so, uh, we, yeah, the last weeks we really journeyed through what is a spiritual journey, and then we covered different forms of prayer. So, intimate dialogue with the Lord, uh, the rosary, uh, the scriptures, uh, all these different topics. So, today we're bringing it all together in practical talk. So, the first thing we'll talk about on the next slide is where did this idea of a holy hour... Oh, first, uh, the goals of this talk. So, there's two main things I want you to take away from this talk. The first thing is just practically what do I do during an hour of prayer? So for a lot of people, uh, if they never prayed for an hour straight before, it's intimidating, and you're not really sure what to do, how to spend that time. And you might be interested, you might have some ideas, but it's like, what do all these other people do? What do the saints do? What do other people do? Uh, so that's one takeaway, and really expanding your idea of prayer. Uh, so prayer is way more than just praying for people, like a list of names, intercessions. Uh, so really hoping to break the walls of your ideas of prayer tonight. And the second thing is just excitement and motivation about holy hours. So I'm hoping you walk away tonight, oh, I've got all these things to try in prayer and really explore with God in relationship with him. And I hope to emphasize there to have, you know, to really enter into holy hours, those, you should bring your whole life to the holy hour. Just be open with Jesus, but then also your holy hour opens up into the rest of your life. So there is a reciprocal relationship there. And we'll talk about more than just that hour today as well. So practical takeaways and then so this motivation. So the next slide, a little bit of the history. So what is this idea of a holy hour? So growing up Protestant, I didn't hear of this idea until I became Catholic. And I really tried praying every day, making that a habit as, as a Protestant. But for some reason, it's just years and years. I kept trying to do that, and it just, uh, there would be seasons of it, and then it would go away. But there, I, I really attribute regular prayer, a daily habit of prayer in my life, to the Eucharist. I think that sacrament, there's something about being confirmed and receiving the Eucharist when I was 24 that it just started happening. I started praying every day. I'm wanting to pray, feeling sort of empty, hungry, if I didn't pray. And so I think it's connected, as we talked before, all these prayer disciplines flow into and come out of the Mass. So every devotion is related to the Mass. So we see this in the history of a holy hour, how they, that sort of idea came about. St. Margaret Mary Alico, she, uh, on the handout here, is shows how Jesus asked her to spend an hour every Thursday evening meditating on his sufferings in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus asked the apostles after they fall asleep during this sort of first holy hour in the gospel, he asked them, could you not stay awake with me one hour? And so this is really the scriptural basis for this devotion, is Jesus asking his apostles in sort of this grief and this longing, could you not stay with me for an hour? And it's a good reminder whenever I'm tempted to just leave my holy hour a little early or I think of something I have to do or um, it's could you not stay with me one hour? You know, am I important to you? Uh, and it, it's something to work up to, you know. Um, you, you pray as you can, not as you can't. Um, but St. Francis de Sales says every one of us needs half an hour of prayer a day except when, you're, when we are busy, then we need an hour. <laughs> and I think Martin Luther has a similar quote. He's like, I'm so busy, uh, something like, you know, when I'm busy, then I pray four hours a day instead of two. I mean, and he was a monk originally, you know, and then all this stuff happened, we know. But uh, that's another quote I've heard. So the saints really have this consensus about praying at least a half an hour a day, practicing, practicing what we call mental prayer. Um, and that's a strong recommendation just to kind of keep that relationship with Jesus going. And there's some other quotes here. Uh, Fulton Sheen, 
He says, we become like that which, which we gaze upon. So ideally, you can spend this time in front of the tabernacle in the church. Uh, that might not always be possible. But uh, Blessed Carlo Acutis said, spending time in front of the tabernacle or the Eucharist in adoration, it's like you're getting a tan from holiness. I forget exactly how you put it, but <laughs> it's like you're just bathing in the sunlight and you're going to be changed. Like your skin changes when it comes into contact with the sun. The same way our soul, if we just sit there, it doesn't even matter how good of a prayer we are. Uh, my spiritual director was telling me just this month, he said, any prayer is good prayer. He said, you shouldn't judge your prayer. Any time you spend in prayer, God appreciates that. He's not sitting there like, oh, I wish you just were never distracted. It's like, no, that's us who are saying that, you know. God knows our humanity, and we bring our humanity to prayer. So uh, that's reassuring. Um, it's like getting sunburned. Something's going to happen if you just sit there in front of Jesus. Uh, Mother Teresa says, what will convert America and save the world? My answer is prayer. What we need is for every parish to come before Jesus in the blessed, blessed, blessed sacrament and holy hours of prayer. And then she says, every holy hour we make so pleases the heart of Jesus that it will be recorded in heaven and retold for all eternity. <laughs> that's pretty incredible, you know. And that's what I have on here. We, we can't even imagine how worthwhile this time is. You know, we really can't. Uh, St. Padre Pio says, a thousand years of enjoying human glory. So all the best things we can imagine on earth, you know, fine wine, good food, Mediterranean beaches, whatever. Uh, it's not worth even an hour spent sweetly communing with Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. So it's really this incomparable joy. Uh, again, Blessed Carlo Acutis, he, uh, he said, people will wait in these super long lines to go to football games or rock concerts, but he was confused why there wasn't this line to get in the church. You know, if God is here, why is there not this long line out the door, you know? So just reframing that, you know. Uh, I think when God pulls back, back the veil at the end of time, all these things will really make a lot of sense, you know. Uh, so, just some motivation about why pray a holy hour, where it comes from. The next slide, I offer a little prayer for beginning a holy hour. And this is a, a practice I recommend. Uh, if you just maybe write your own prayers, I think God appreciates that. You know, you might not write the next Hail Mary or something, you know, <laughs> but just something that stirs you when you begin or end a holy hour. Uh, and this is something I came up with uh, and how I usually start my holy hours. It's just simply, Lord, bless this holy hour. So asking for him, knowing that he has a power to bless this time, in which I hope to encounter you. So this act of hope, and that's the goal, is I want to encounter you, God, in this time. Whether through silence or visions, delightful or painful, or any sort I know not. This is just opening up to whatever God wants for this hour. Uh, we talked about in the first week, your prayer will change through your spiritual life. So at the beginning, you, it's like drawing water out of a well. And it's a lot of work, and you get this little drop of consolation and spiritual, you know, good, delight. Then later toward the end, it's like rain just falling on the garden and the Lord is just flooding you with grace. And that's a different kind of prayer, like active versus passive, uh, working at meditation versus contemplation. And so we flow into these different types of prayer and being open to thing like, things like visions. You know, if we're not open to it, God won't give it to us. So if he wants us to have a supernatural experience, then we can let him. But we shouldn't be attached to those things. We should be ready to give those up for whatever he wants to give. So this, I, I have Mary's 
receptive words here. Let it be done to me according to thy word. So entering into that spirituality of Mary. Thank you for being a God who dwells among us. So again, like flowing out of the incarnation, like God is in this tabernacle and he became flesh 2,000 years ago and he is here present with us till the end of the age. May I receive this truth in awe and wonder. This is the response I hope to have to God, is this awe and wonder. Lift my heart and mind with love to yourself. So I forget which saint defined prayer as lifting the heart and mind to God. I think it's in the catechism. Um, so this just kind of sums up a lot of things about prayer. So you can write a similar prayer yourself or try this one. And um, it's nice to have something like that to get you in the right frame of mind. Uh, and actually that last section of the catechism, I'll mention that, uh, it's all about prayer. So there's four parts to the catechism and the last part is about prayer and it's the shortest. I recommend looking at that, it's really helpful. The next slide is where we start getting into practical things. So where do I begin with the holy hour? And there's kind of two main outlines I've found really helpful and they both come from the saints, so we can trust it. The first is from St. Teresa of Avila, and there's more details on the handout, but the first step she recommends is really prepare for this time. Find a quiet place and a suitable time. So for the tabernacle, a home, a home altar, um, I don't know if anyone has that practice of setting aside a space in your house for prayer. That's a really nice practice. Maybe putting, usually a home altar traditionally will have a crucifix and then an image of Mary and Jesus, the Madonna and child, and then the right uh, glorified image of Jesus. So maybe he's holding the word of God or just some image of the risen Jesus. And so those three things, you have a home altar. You can buy two little icons and a crucifix, uh, have a little prayer space, um, or a spot in nature. I love praying by water. If there's water nearby, just going down there. And then the second step, is recollecting yourself, just realizing you're in the presence of God, placing yourself in his presence. You might start with a prayer like we just read or repeating the name of Jesus, meditating on his presence in the Eucharist, uh, different methods there, just quieting yourself. And then the third step is something to meditate upon. So scripture is obviously sort of the preference or some spiritual reading. And then the fourth step is responding to what you read. So that's where in week two we talked about this intimate dialogue with the Lord. So entering into that dialogue, perhaps you journal about it or perhaps it stirs up something in you. You start sharing those emotions with the Lord or you're confused, you're really dry in prayer, like we talked about in week three. Maybe you just sit there in that dryness. It's like, Lord, it's hard. A lot of holy, maybe I didn't, wasn't able to do my holy hour in the morning or afternoon, and it's like 9 p.m. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm a seminarian. I've committed to this holy hour. Uh, so I come, sometimes I'll come here, the church is locked. I'll go in the little chapel and just do my holy hour. And it, the whole time might just be really dry. But it's like, Lord, thank you, I'm here. You're here, and that's enough for me right now. And just kind of sitting in that. Um, your mind does wander thinking everywhere. Yeah, it does. Yeah, my mind does wander a lot. Uh, it's a very common experience. Yeah, I'm distracted, and I'm thinking about my to do list, what I'm doing tomorrow, you know, all these things. And uh, my spiritual director was saying, uh, He's like, okay, you're thinking about your to-do list. Are you doing that with the Lord? Whatever you're doing in your holy hour, wherever your mind's going, sometimes it could be the Holy Spirit leading you to think about this thing that you have to do later. And maybe you've been avoiding it or stirring up something in you. Are you thinking about that with the Lord? And so, are... Yeah, so it's... uh, it's, yeah, so that's what I'm hoping tonight. Just expand your idea of what prayer is. Even, like, why is my mind going there? Because the, the way the intellect works, 
is this drawn to something. Where if you start to notice, and if you, do, if you practice this sort of holy hour every day, silence, you'll notice your mind going to places. And they might be scary places, places you don't want to think about, or stressful, or um, people you're in conflict with. It's like, go there with the Lord. That's what the Lord wants to be with you there. Uh, there is a beautiful story my friend shared where he was praying through a, a memory of being bullied when he was growing up. And this was kind of being brought up during a retreat. And the Lord took him back into that memory. That's another faculty of our mind is memory and imagination. So we use all these in holy hour, intellect, memory, imagination. So he, the Lord sort of transformed this memory of being bullied where in that memory he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned around and the Lord was standing behind him. Mm-hmm. And then the Lord, just the Lord's presence in that moment, he, like the bully became very small and he realized the Lord had been with him in, in that moment when he was a child and had never let him go. And it was greatly healing for him. Like that insecurity that he had felt ever since then, which you, you kind of carry that in your body even those wounds of the past. Uh, if you meet someone who is like that bully from your childhood, you can even notice your shoulders might hunch or you get like a feeling in the pit of your stomach that the Lord heals those things through this encounter in the holy hour and this imagination, memory. So just an example of what can happen in this fourth step. Uh, a lot can happen. And then the good way to close the holy hour is make some kind of resolution. So again, bringing your life into the holy hour and then pouring forth, like the end of Mass, you know, go forth, proclaim the good news, and we're sending you out. Dismiss the est, where the word Mass comes from, is you are dismissed, you know. It's kind of an interesting origin for the word Mass, dismissa. Uh, But we're being sent forth, uh, so this is one uh, structure. This is from a, a good book, Father Thomas Dubé's Prayer Primer. A lot of things I've been talking about, just a clear explanation of the basics of prayer. And the next slide has a, another outline. There's a lot of similar elements. Uh, the first step, placing yourself in the presence of God. This is from St. Francis de Sales. And I don't know if you know much about him, but... He was sort of revolutionary, and he, the first, one of the first saints to really have a spirituality for the laity, because a lot of saints were writing for religious or monks or priests, but he said, this is how lay people can pray. Uh, it's very practical. And step two is ask the Lord to help you pay attention to him, open yourself up. And he also has some kind of reading, a meditation on that, Then he really emphasizes this step five, affections. If these affections rise up in you, um, of course we can't force that to happen. That's not the way emotions work. And we shouldn't let emotions rule our lives. It's like, I've heard the metaphor, it's like the puppies running the household if we let our emotions run our life. Um, But it gives us indications of what's going on in our heart and our soul. So... Yield to these affections, bring them into the, your prayer. And then he, step six, he also recommends resolutions. But then at the end, he recommends ending with this gratitude to God for this time of prayer, making an offering of ourselves to the Lord. Uh, we can make that in, in conjunction with the Mass, kind of like Divine Mercy Chaplet. I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity. And then at maybe a short time of intercession. So offering up the sacrifice of this time, which is really a sacrifice um, for somebody in particular or a group of people. So then I have some commentary here. Uh, he, We'll talk more about this, but these are just ways to start. So you don't want to follow it mechanically. You don't feel like you're boxed in with these suggestions. Uh, Next slide. 
this is just opening up your idea of prayer again. So these are this is a, my own list of things that have been helpful to me, different ways I pray. Uh, scripture is a big part of my prayer. I try to do that every holy hour, go to the scripture at some point. Even if my spiritual reading cites some scripture, maybe I'll go to that place, and then that's the rest of my holy hour is with that scripture. Uh, journaling, like I talked about in the second talk, with a multicolor pen. Sometimes today I forgot my multicolor pen in my holy hour. I went back to the rectory to get it because <laughs> like, I'm kind of dependent on this pen. But <laughs> uh, memorizing scripture, this has been really fruitful for me. I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but even just, I remember in college, I'd have a lot of these five or 10 minute walks throughout my day. And I would just have the scripture as my phone background. And I would look at one verse and just say that over and over on my way to class. Or have it written on a piece of paper. And especially with the Psalms, I started memorizing like entire Psalms. And they started naturally turn into a song as I tried to memorize it. They sort of have a rhythm to them. And then I, like some of these I'll never forget because they're like a song in my head now. So some holy hours I just repeat a scripture or paragraph over and over and the Lord will reveal amazing things I've been going through the gospel of John slowly and John is so profound every word every especially the verbs that John uses there's so much meaning like you can't even get to the bottom of it uh, so it's incredible hmm? I use it, yeah, which scripture translation do I use? That's a good question. So uh, I use several different ones. I, I like the RSV. I think that's more literal. Um, yeah, the New American Standard, I think, is the one we use in the Mass. And then uh, I grew up with Protestant translations, so sometimes I'll go back to those just because they're, like, in my heart. Uh, and... I've read, I, like I've, the one, one habit I have is every night before bed, I'll read scripture for 10 minutes, sort of close my day, and I've had that since, like, seventh grade, so it's been really fearful. I just read straight through the Bible a couple of times. The first time was NIV, uh, which, that, I don't recommend that now, but it was, it's poetic, which was nice, and then I read a more paraphrased translation, with that actually rearranged the Bible into chronological order. So I don't know if anyone listens to Bible in a year, but that does a similar thing where it, it goes through the chronological story, and rearranges it, and then comments on it. So the second time through, I had it with commentary. And then the third time, the ESV is very close to the RSV. And it's a good study Bible. It's a Protestant study Bible, but... In terms of the, just the historical facts in there and the maps and the charts, it's like I can't find a, as good a study Bible as ESV. Uh, so if you're, kinda, if you're solid in your Catholic doctrine, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I know there's other Catholic study Bibles coming out. There's a good New Testament one from Ignatius Press. I read through that. That was RSV. So, anyway, I love different translations. And there's a website called Bible Hub, and you can look at the original language. If you go to the interlinear tab in BibleHub.com, you can look at the original Greek and Hebrew. If you click like the little number above each word, and sometimes I'll do that in the, my holy hour. I'm like, I try not to be on my phone, but I'll turn all the notifications off and whatever. And then, so I can't even see if they pop up, but I'll look at a word, and it's like, wow, this... So one word has been in the Gospel of John, the word remain or abide. In Greek, it's meno, like M-E-N-O. And this word shows up throughout the Gospel. Uh, so like the very first question of Jesus, when he's, the first question he asks in the Gospel, uh, that some, John says, behold the Lamb of God. The, the two disciples follow start following Jesus, he turns around and he says, what do you seek? So we can meditate on that. That's a powerful question. Like, what am I seeking in general? And then their response is a question. 
It's where are you staying? And it uses that verb, meno. Where are you remaining? Where are you abiding? Where are you dwelling? And then from that point, throughout the gospel, that word comes up. So like after he talks with, Jesus talks with Nicodemus, it says, he went to the region of Judea, and there he manoed with them. He remained with them. And then the famous, you know, vine and branches, chapter 15, they remain in me, and I in you. So there's all, it just weaves throughout the whole gospel, this one word. So that's another thing you can do as a word study. And the website, like Bible Hub, will give you all the scriptures with the same word. And you can get a sense of what that word means. So, yeah, good question. Uh, and then we talked about the liturgy of the hours. That's something you can do during your holy hour. Uh, vocal prayers, like the rosary, by mercy chaplet, um, litanies, novenas. And then silence, of course, uh, you know, being very generous with silence. Is sort of a main part of a holy hour. Um, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was probably silent a lot of that time. Music. So it's kind of more on retreat. If I'm, I have these sort of days of prayer, I'll like take a walk, listen to some like praise and worship, or maybe sing one of those psalms if I'm alone, you know. <laughs> Prayerful list making. So... I don't know if this is just me, but uh, you can see this handout is a lot of lists. But <laughs> um, this, I think this is it's almost a spiritual practice I've noticed. Is m- most of the time it's a gratitude list, which a lot of people talk about the value of that, doing that every day. Um, but there's a lot of different kind of lists you can make. People you're grateful for, people you're praying for, scripture, your favorite scriptures, maybe to start memorizing. Uh, your list of saints, like who's your saint team? You can just make a list of that. Uh, list of sins or temptations you're fighting right now. Just to name them and then make that battle intentional. Bring that to confession. List of things you're passionate about, your dreams, uh, things you're good at, you're gifted at. Uh, you can go through your past kind of name the seasons of your life and just meditate on that. That's a good thing to do on a retreat. A list of unanswered questions. Uh, yeah, so I think list making is a sort of thing you can do. And then composing poetry, songs, prayers. So we read some St. John of the Cross poems earlier. Uh, so just... Uh, all different things you can do. So the next slide, this is, this is probably the third main takeaway. So it's like I show you all these methods, and then I say there is no method. <laughs> so it's like a lot of Catholic teachings. It's like, it seems like a paradox, but you've got to hold these things in tension. So the, this, this list, again, <laughs> more or less, of Father Thomas Dubé. He, he talks about this teaching of the saints. There's no one method. We're all unique. And we have these unique relationships with God. So our, these methods are like scaffolding. So when you're building a building, you build all the scaffolding. It takes up a lot of space. It's a little awkward. But then once the building's there, you can take the scaffolding down. So I'm sort of giving these methods to you, but then you're going to find your own, you know, you're going to create your own beautiful way you pray and then the scaffolding can all go away. Uh, and prayer is going to change the different seasons of life, like we talked about. He emphasizes being unhurried. So you might be like, I'm going to read. This is something I struggle with. It's like, I want to read at least two pages of this you know, book from a saint every holy hour. I want to like, read two pages. But then sometimes something strikes me in the first paragraph. It's like, okay, I just need to stay there. I need to mano there, <laughs> remain there, and the rest of the hour, maybe. So that should be the attitude you go in with. Uh, so I think this is St. Teresa of Avila. The most important thing is not to think much, but to love much. So as important as the intellect is in what we call mental prayer, it really the goal is the heart. So it's like the verse, 
faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. So that's our goal. Uh, and I love the point that in heaven, faith and hope, we, we won't need those anymore. Because faith, we'll see. We'll see everything now. Hope, will have what we hoped for. But love will remain forever. So when we love that theological vir- virtue, we're participating in an eternal action. Whereas faith and hope are really temporary. So that's, that's where we want to end up in our holy hour, is that eternal love of the Trinity. And uh, you must not tire, tire yourself by trying to think a great deal or worry. Again, sort of judging your prayer. You don't want to spend so much time doing that. Like, oh, I'm so bad at praying. I'm distracted. Like, you don't want to just go in there and discourage yourself for an hour. Because then you're not really with the Lord. The Lord's voice is always encouraging, loving, the fruits of the Spirit, joy, peace, patience. But what if you think that you need to be, that God's talking to you and it's really not? Yeah, what if you think if God's talking to you and it's really not God? So, yeah, that's something. Uh, if you go back, I think the week three, we talked about discernment of spirits. And so there's ways to discern, is this from God, is this from the devil, or is this just from my own mind? Uh, So, you know, kind of like, I I like to, it's good to be gentle with yourself, too. Uh, Sometimes I'll call them, like, mind farts, or like brain farts, you know, just like random thoughts that come, and some of them might really bother you, like some weird temptation, but as long as your will isn't assenting to that, there's no... It's, there's no like sin involved, or there's no nothing bad. Things will just come into your mind, and I think of them like clouds. Like you just let the cloud pass by. It might be a dark cloud; you might not enjoy it, but just be at peace. This storm will pass. So sometimes you, some days you wake up in a funk, you know, really discouraged, but that cloud's gonna pass at some point. Uh, so yeah, it's a good question, and then uh, keeps. Number five, keep simplicity. So don't be over-concerned with methods. Follow the Holy Spirit's lead. You might need to try new things. If your prayer gets kind of stale, you can come back to this handout maybe. Be like, let's, let's try something else. Uh, so scripture itself doesn't really have something like this. Scripture doesn't say this is the way you should pray. Uh, look, uh, in a way, like our gospel today was, Lord, teach us to pray. And then he teaches them a vocal prayer, the Our Father. And that's something you can meditate with and lead you to contemplation. So those three movements of prayer we've been talking about all all these sessions, vocal, meditative, contemplative, uh, these are all interleaved. And as we pray, we grow more toward contemplative, that gift of God, of existing in relationship with him, of wordless, imageless, uh, sort of gaze between you and God. So the last point, he, Father Thomas Dubé, he lived during a time, I think it was like the 80s, when there was a lot of emphasis on this Eastern meditation. And it was kind of, the goal is to empty your mind, sort of like Buddhist meditation. But he says that Christian prayer is different. There is a sense in emptying, like detachment. St. John of the Cross emphasizes you need to be t- detached from sin. But... You need to be filled up with something. You know, it's like that gospel. You might exercise one demon from a house, but then seven worse demons come. So you don't want to just leave the house empty. You want Jesus to be in the house. <laughs> That's the answer, is to fill yourself with Christ, uh, like communion does physically and spiritually. So we're different than Eastern methods of prayer. So it's just a good list about there not being one method and holding that intention with the methods. The next slide has just some book recommendations. So I've referenced Prayer Primer. The second method list I got from Fulfillment of All Desire is by Ralph Martin. And this is a good book. It just quotes a lot of saints about how to pray and how to grow in the spiritual life. It goes through the three ways, like purgative, illuminative, unitive, like we talked about in week one. It's an excellent book. I recommend it. Uh, Personal Prayer by 
Father Tom Sacklin, Father Boniface Hicks. These are Benedictine monks who live an hour away from us. Uh, this book is like sold all over the world now. It's really, we really focus on the psychological side of prayer because they're both trained in psychology. So I recommend that if you're, you want to know sort of the emotional, psychological approach to prayer. And then Introduction to the Devout Life is a classic by St. Francis de Sales, like a spirituality for lay people. So the next slide. This is where we kind of get to the second point. So we looked at practical things. And then this is about your whole life outside of the holy hour. So these are just recommendations of growing in your spiritual life, uh, different practices, uh, daily mass if it's possible. Again, pray as you can, not as you can't. So like the saints don't say, you know, you have to go to daily mass to get to heaven. You know, we don't want to place all these obligations. Uh, the church has said, you know, the way to obey the one of the Ten Commandments about keeping the Lord's Day holy is going to Mass every Sunday, and that's serious. Uh, daily Mass is a great devotion. Uh, and then regular confession, uh, every two to five weeks. If you go every two to five weeks, I heard someone say, you should be going to confession more often than your dentist. <laughs> you think your teeth need to be clean, how much more your soul, you know? So, uh, but I think a lot of people kind of get into this rhythm of about monthly uh, it's really amazing what that can do. And then also, if you learn a little bit about it, indulgences, you can earn like one indulgence every day to uh, offer for a soul in purgatory. And one of, the con one of the requirements is plus or minus 21 days having been to confession. So they expanded that, uh, I think, of the Year of Mercy recently. Um, to plus or minus 21 days, but then every day you can offer up an indulgence for a soul in purgatory. Uh, so that's really powerful. Uh, fasting. Fasting and prayer really go together. Are we willing to give up food and in order to just hunger for God? Yeah. Um, with indulgences, have you already covered that? Uh, no, we haven't, we haven't covered indulgence. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll review a little bit about that. So uh, the requirements for an indulgence are, uh, and if, well, so there's all this controversy, right, in the Protestant Reformation, and the idea is, Jesus, it all comes from God, really, and he, he just had, the church has like a treasury of merit, has all these graces to give to the world, and indulgences are a way when we participate in channeling those graces. Uh, just like Mary, her intercession channels a lot of graces to us. Uh, and so the way the church has sort of outlined the requirements for, to receive and send these graces uh, and it's, it's some action so the easiest ones are that you know are half an hour of scripture meditation a half an hour in front of a tabernacle uh, praying a rosary in community praying a rosary in front of the tabernacle uh so you can look up like a list of actions that uh, will earn an indulgence. And then it's having gone to confession, plus or minus 21 days, receiving communion in a state of grace, and, uh, and then praying for the Pope. So usually uh, our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be, or the Creed, and, and with the intention of praying for the Pope. I think that's it. Four? Is anyone else? Remember? Okay. <laughs> so, I think that's it. Yeah, you can look it up just to make sure. But those four things, and you, I, I try to do that every day. And that's actually, I think the church, it's a gift to have these laws. A lot of the Psalms say, Lord, how I love your law. You know, I meditate on your law. Because if we live it out, Jesus says, if you love me, you obey my commands. If we live out these suggestions no, there's laws and then suggestions but like half an hour in front of the tabernacle every day or praying the rosary in community these things will bless us you know so it's a good sort of benchmark to try to see if you can you know offer an indulgence every day that's this great or at least every sunday uh yeah
That's a good question. And fasting, uh, this was so powerful in my spiritual life, just practicing regular fasting, starting small, you know, maybe one meal a week, sort of like what the church offers during Lent. Uh, Maybe no meat every Friday of the year could be a way to start or offering, you know, instead of lunch every Friday, maybe you do a holy hour, something like that. So I try to replace that time I spent eating with prayer and I kind of started with something every Friday and then, you know, maybe certain seasons, maybe you slowly expand to fasting for 24 hours or um, I remember I was at a church and the whole staff fasted together for five days, no food. And I was like, I didn't know people did that, you know. So, but you work up to some, like something like that, and you really want to talk in spiritual direction. Or like tell somebody you're doing it, work up to it. You want to be safe with it. But again, like people can live for like 30 to 40 days without food, you know. Assuming you're healthy, you know, your doctor, you talk to your doctor, you know. Yeah, age as well. Yeah, you can, uh, yeah. And so sometimes it's offering the sufferings you already have, too, like tiredness or a certain health condition. So, but there is a, yeah, those, those things can go together in general, like offering up maybe no snacks for an afternoon or, you know. So, but again, don't, uh, I think in general our society is too cautious with fasting, but again, there are people you can go too far, so. But if you notice Matthew chapter 6, it says when you fast. He doesn't say if you fast. So he says when you fast, don't do it so that other people know. Don't announce it on the street corner. Uh, But that's, I think, just a regular part of the spiritual life. Um, Yeah, all these things could kind of be their own talk. (laughs) uh, Simplicity and poverty simplifying our life to make room for God, uh, study, and things like this, you know, reading, regular spiritual reading, solitude, having some kind of regular retreats. Uh, so I offer some other things. Something you might not think about, celebration is part of the spiritual life. We have these big feast days in the church. Do we really embrace those? Do we celebrate them with our family? Like Christmas is, you know, part of our culture. But maybe like Pentecost, maybe we don't do anything with our family for some of these other big feasts. Uh, and then spiritual direction, small group. Maybe you're, it's hard to find spiritual directors sometimes, but at least having a small group where you can share things with each other and pray for each other. That's been so important in my life. So uh, I think the next slide. I think... Some more of this I'll just kind of leave you with. I'm not going to go through everything. Uh, These are just kind of resources for you. Um, This is something to pray with about. uh, You might feel like I'm not growing in my prayer in these holy hours. You know, what is it my fault or is it just this spiritual season? But these are conditions of growth based on Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, that Father Thomas Dubé talks about in his book, Fire Within, which is kind of a more intense book. But uh, he, this first point, these first two points are all I'll emphasize here. The first isn't to grow in prayer. It's not finding this perfect ideal method as doing your holy hour. So again, sort of holding that in paradox. It's really about doing God's will. And that's common that across people and different for each person at the same time. And number two, growing in prayer doesn't depend on your situation. So you might say, you know, because of my health, I can't, you know, do a holy hour or I can't lose a sleep or um, because of my job situation or uh, like having uh, because of my children or different things. I can't do this, so I guess I'll never be holy. That's not, <laughs> that's not a way to think. You can always grow in prayer. You can always grow in holiness, and that's always possible, no matter your situation. And then you're judged. Yeah, and then you're the judge of, yeah, exactly. You become the judge of, and, you know, I'm, I can't pray as I should. 
or I'm not, I'm bad at prayer. And those thoughts are never coming from God. So, so I'll emphasize those two. The next slide is uh, this powerful quote from St. John of the Cross that gets me every time. He says, O my soul, created for these grandeurs and called thereto, what are you doing? How do you spend your time? So the saints talk a lot about we only have one life on earth. You know, before the social media saying YOLO, like you only live once, you know, became popular. But it's true. You only have one lifetime. We don't believe in reincarnation and things like that. It's just you have a certain amount of days on earth, like we talked about with the rosary, now in the hour of our death. They're the only two guaranteed moments in our life. And so uh, with this quote, I, I have a, another spiritual practice. Again, this is better for a retreat or something like that, is making a sort of time audit of your life. So you, maybe you keep a budget of how you spend your money. Uh, you might itemize that or something or have categories. But you can do the same thing with your time. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people might do that or think about that. But I remember in college, I felt really overwhelmed. I was involved in too many things. And, and I was like, I don't have time to pray. you know. And I knew I needed to decommit from things, but I didn't know what. So what I did was I just like, made a detailed calendar. You could do it on paper or Google Calendar or something, and just for a week, it's annoying, but track like every 15 minutes for a week of what you do. And then see, like, and then maybe make a list of your priorities in life, you know, like God, family, friends, job, like learning, different things, priorities, exercise, sleep, food. Uh, and then match your priorities to how you spend your time. And I think it's very illuminating, you know, it's like, oh, I watch TV this much every night, or you know, I spend this much time getting ready in the morning. Maybe I can, you know, rearrange my day, or I spend this much time commuting. Maybe I can listen to Bible in a year or something. So just look where, uh, how you're spending your time, like in light of this quote. So uh, next slide has, this will be the last main point, but uh, this I found brings a lot of peace. I've given you a lot of things to think about, um, priorities in life, prayer, things like that. Uh, But when I get back into my day, after my holy hour, sometimes I can get overwhelmed or I think about this advice from a book, uh, The Soul of the Apostolate. He says there's two things you can follow that will help you have a peaceful life. I'm like, okay, what are they? He says, first thing, take more time than you need for everything you do. And so often we're rushing through our day. It's like, I just need to do this quick. I need to do this quick. We're trying to multitask, and then we end up scattered and not doing anything well. So he says, take more time than you need for everything. And then the second point is do the most important thing first. So sometimes I'll enter my day here at the parish and like, okay, the most important thing is to pray. So I'm going to do that first, you know, even if I want to respond to all these emails or whatever. It's like, I'm going to do that first, you know. Sometimes you have to, there's things you have to do at certain times, of course. Uh, but that sort of free time, we have a little free time every day, hopefully. <laughs> it's like, what's the most important way to spend that time and do that first? Maybe it's calling someone in your family that you've been putting off or and ask the Lord to reveal that in your holy hour. So I have a quote you can read on your own from John Henry Newman, just about your irreplaceability of your specific life. He says, he's committed some work to you, which he has not committed to another. That's like your life. He's shaped. So the rest of this handout is just more ways you can read through to expand your vision of what prayer is. It's like a three-column list of 21 different types of prayer. So this made a big impact on me early in my spiritual life. I was like, wow, I didn't know prayer was this expansive. Like only one of them is intercessory prayer. Sometimes people reduce it all to just that. Uh, 
Hmm? Oh, uh, page four on the bottom right. It's like a long, almost over half a page, page four. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, this is a great quote to just sit with. Um, just again, emphasizing like there's no one method. Every person is so unique. Uh, God's created you so unique, and he, he loves you more than you can imagine. And he just desires this relationship with you. Um, on the back, I just have, uh, I think the next slide, I have the, this chart again, um, which I showed the first week. Uh, yeah, next slide. So that, again, not to just make prayer this personal improvement project, but you need to live it out in community and mission. So a well-rounded spiritual life involves, it's not just a self-help program. It's like God wants your whole life, and you need to live this out in community. You know, love God and love your neighbor. And loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So all those faculties we talked about with your memory, your imagination, your intellect, your heart, your soul, and then also your body with all your strength. So in prayer, your posture matters, you know. Maybe you pray out loud with your voice. Maybe you, like, the way you hold your hands or, like, just appreciating the things around you, the creation God's given if you're taking a walk. Uh, praying with your, all your being. God wants you to love him with all your being, and we do that in the holy hour. I think there's something really powerful about that. Um, and then the last slide, I just have a song recommendation of the week. I didn't get a chance to uh, put it on the sheet uh, but you could write it down. It's called Climb by United Pursuit. It's nine minutes, so I'm not going to play it now. But uh, if you listen to this song, just like kind of take it into prayer. And it, I think it really leads from meditation on a few truths. Uh, it starts, you know, I lean not on my own understanding. Uh, my life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. So he's repeating these truths that are, beautiful truths about God. And then it leads into this like wordless vocalization. And, and I think that's sort of a picture of contemplation. And then it's like a, the same melody, but the melody keeps going up in pitch. It keeps getting higher and higher. And so it's like this experience of contemplation you drawing you in deeper and deeper into God. And then it's like, comes like I'll climb this mountain with my hands wide open it's this moment of surrender like the image of John the cross sees the spiritual life like a mountain the ascent of Mount Carmel he calls it like Elijah going up the mountain or transfiguration and uh, so there's a resolution like in this moment of surrender of deep encounter with God we make this resolution I'm going to climb this mountain I'm going to offer my life and then at the very end it falls sort of falls down again it gets quiet, and uh, the singer says, I'm so in love with you, uh, you know, and things like that. And it's just sort of this affectionate moment with Jesus. Uh, I'm so in love with you, there's no one else for me. So just, and that, if, if you ever read the, book, the Song of Songs in the Bible, some people are like, what is this? Why is this in the Bible? It's like so sexual and, you know, but there's a, beautiful book called The Cantata of Love, which this Jesuit talks about. Uh, Armand John is his last name. But he talks about the Song of Songs as a spiritual, a metaphor for the spiritual life. And the soul's relationship with God is so deep. Like the best image we have for it is like the, the marital act because that's the most intimate physical image we have of the Trinitarian love. Like the love between... Two people becomes a third person, like the Trinity. And, you know, we're like even we're all born out of love. And so this Song of Songs, it, it's like really the unitive way. It's sort of describing the heights of the spiritual life. Um, so that's sort of the end of this song, is this affectionate. The soul and God is like the spiritual marriage, like the Old Testament, Israel and God. Uh, so I'll leave you with that image. I hope you all enter that contemplation, that deep affection uh, in your spiritual life. I hope you all can take something away. Uh, and 
Again, if your prayer gets dry, these, hopefully you can come back to this handout, or these talks are all posted on YouTube. Uh, and it's been a real privilege for me just to just share uh, everything I can about prayer that's helped me. And uh, what's your YouTube? Uh, so this is all on Divine Grace YouTube. So if you search Divine Grace Parish, Divine Grace PGH, uh, all these videos are on there. I'm going to make a playlist of them eventually, but you can go back. And the handouts are all in there, too. So, yeah. If you want, I'll, I'll play the song in the recording because I'm going to have to reload it. Okay. So, the same buffering problem. Okay, so he'll, he'll play the song yeah, if so you I'll find this video. The end of the, of the video. Yeah, it'll, it'll be on that video. And then you can also just look it up. This song is on YouTube as well. So, I've, I've prayed a lot with this, this song. It's good. So we'll, we'll, close, we'll close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord Jesus, we give you great gratitude for this uh, time together. I just ask a special blessing on everyone here that you open their hearts wider uh, to receive more of your love, whether through silence or visions, delightful or painful, or any way they know not. I ask that you bless them and that, like Mary, they would receive your message for their lives and live that out and continue the story of your salvation in this world and into the next. Write a beautiful song through our lives that has never been sung before. And we join with Mary's gratitude as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All the angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all so much. Again, thanks for joining. Thank you for
There's nothing I hold on to. There's nothing I hold on to. There's nothing.